Welcome to the next part of this lecture on historical linguistics and the discovery of Indo-European by William Jones. Uh, we talked a little about who he was and how he came about to discover it, and I'm going to read something that uh, from what he had to say upon learning Sanskrit and his uh, about his miraculous discovery that Sanskrit had all these similarities to Greek and Latin. The Sanskrit Latin, whatever be its antiquity, is of a wonderful structure, more perfect than the Greek, more copious than the Latin, and more exquisitely refined than either, yet bearing to both of them a stronger affinity, both in the roots of verbs and the forms of grammar, than could possibly have been produced by accident. That's the key. So strong indeed that no philologer, and the philology was the older word for, for the study of historical linguistics, no philologer could examine them all three without believing them to have sprung from some common source, which perhaps no longer exists. There is a similar reason, though not quite so forcible, for supposing that both the Gothic, which is an early Germanic language, and the Celtic, though blended with a very different idiom, had the same origin with the Sanskrit, and the old Persian might be added to the same family. This is the big Eureka moment. What Jones is doing here is called the comparative method, and he's looking at similarities in grammar and the roots of verbs that, and, and their structure. And we're going to talk about what, in fact, he was looking at. But just a bit more, what is Sanskrit? Sanskrit is the sacred language of, of India and of the, the, the Indian South Asian culture, particularly the Hindu culture. Um, it is the ancestor of a lot of, Indo of modern Indian languages, including Hindi, Gujarati, um, and also Urdu, uh, and, and others. Um, here are some 15th century manuscripts of Sanskrit written on carefully preserved palm leaves. This was the, the writing that was used, and, and, the, and the, the particular kind of writing was called Devanagari. Um, the language is codified by a grammarian named Panini back in, in the 4th century BCE, which is, uh, you know, around the time of Alexander the Great. So we're talking a long time ago. Uh, but Vedic Sanskrit, some of the oldest Sanskrit texts uh, of the Rig Veda, which is one of the oldest sacred texts of the Hindu religion, dates back to the early 2nd millennium BCE. So we're talking texts that are as old or older as as older than um, Genesis and Exodus. Uh, we're talking about considerable, and that would make these, in fact, the oldest Indo-European writings that survive, or among them, because uh, Genesis and Exodus are, of course, Semitic writings, not Indo-European. So this takes us back rather far, um, before perhaps. Uh, the Germanic languages had um, split into various different sub-languages, but about that more later. So what does it mean to compare these different languages? What, what did he learn upon looking and thinking about different languages? Well, let's look at the way that the word to be uh, is structured in various languages, right? In English, we say, I am, you are, she is. We are, you are, they are, right? In Old English, it's each eom, vu ert, seo is, eom ert is. We can see how that becomes m art, as in thou art, is. And Sindon's race was later replaced by just r. Um, in Gothic, im is ist, sium siuth sint. In Latin, sum es est, sum es estis sunt. Greek, amy a esti esmen esti esi. These are the words for I am, you, uh, you are, he is, we are, y'all are, they are, right? And we could s see a little bit of similarity, but there wouldn't have been surprising to people that Latin and Greek were related. But here, a thousand miles away in a, in a civilization and culture seemingly unrelated to Latin and Greek, we see in the Sanskrit version of this verb, I am is asmi, you are is asi, that he is, is asti. And we can see how this has similarities to both the Greek 
and the Latin, and you can see how Jones might have drawn the conclusion that he did. Asmi asi astisimas sta santi. You can see how this is connected to both sunt santi estis sta este. Um, and then I give dadami is in Sanskrit, didomi in Greek. Dadasi didos, dadati didosi. The connection is clear and obvious. And if you look at the Persian language as well, um, not listed here, but the, the language that is the ancestor to modern Iranian, that is also part of this Indo-European group of languages that all share a common ancestor. So we can imp uh, compare the inflectional system, and we can also compare lexicon, that is, the words and the way that the words are, are, are um, you know, words for things. So let's look at the numerals, right? Numerals are things that change very little over time. So in, we, we have here a list of English, Old German, Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit. One, eins, unis, heis, ekas. But then Japanese, which is totally unrelated to Indo-European languages, hiitotsu. Tu, twai, duo, duo, dua. Futatsu, three, three, tres, tres, trias, mitsu. I'm reminded of the old Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the others. Um, okay, and so on. You can see the the connection between the um, these words and how they probably share a common root, and that's just in the number system. But you can see all kinds of differences uh, throughout. Um, so the the conclusion then is that. Um, all of these had one common ancestor, and the name that has been given to this hypothesized ancestor language is Proto-Indo-European, or P-I-E for short, Pi. Um, and it's theorized that it was spoken anywhere between four and 6,000 years ago, probably 6,000 years ago. Um, it's the common ancestor of English, German, Spanish, French, also Iranian, Hindi, Armenian, Irish, Greek, and in fact, dozens, if not hundreds, of other languages, including all the Slavic languages, Russian, Uranian, uh, Ukrainian, Polish, and so on. Where do they come from? Somewhere in Western or Central Asia, as, as we saw from the beginning. Um, and what they share in common is that, especially in the older um, forms, they share a, a complex inflectional morphology. Now, before we talk more about the Indo-European language family, I think if you haven't studied linguistics before, um, I think you should look at 2.1b next, uh, a short lecture on inflectional morphology and what that is. So this is to be continued.